The moment you've been waiting for, now come the lawyers. <laughs> uh, you should congratulate yourself for having managed to stay attentive for a conference on an accounting method. Uh, that's really quite a feat. Uh, mark to market, treating assets as if they've been sold and recognizing corresponding gains or losses, or pay as you profit, as the congresswoman told us, which may be a little catchier. Uh, we are lucky today, in terms of lawyers, to have with us uh, Lily Batchelder to my immediate left. Uh, Lily is a tax professor at NYU and one of the leading uh, tax scholars whose work is almost always timely in setting the agenda. She just this last month uh, published a paper, Taxing the Rich, Issues and Options, with her colleague uh, David Kamen at NYU. Uh, to her left, uh, two of the country's uh, leading uh, tax uh, practitioners. Uh, virtually every list of top tax practitioners would include Lucy Farr, a partner at Davis uh, Polk, and uh, Mike Schler, a longtime partner, now of counsel at Cravath, Swain, and Moore. And so our plan uh, this morning is to share a lawyer's perspective of the issues you've heard from economists. We'll try to be grounded as practically as we can. Uh, we tend to veer off into interpretations of words, uh, but you'll forgive us for that. It turns out that's a lot of what implementing tax law uh, constitutes. So we've divided our, our, our presentation in roughly uh, two segments. Uh, Lily will start with a question why should we pursue a mark-to-market method of tax accounting, a pay-as-you-profit uh, approach to uh, capital assets and other assets? And then we'll turn to our practitioners uh, to address, well, what has been our experience with mark-to-market methods of accounting? And uh, what are the challenges of trying to extend those practices uh, much more broadly as being discussed now? Uh, and then we'll have some questions. Uh, but with that, uh, I've encouraged, by the way, the, the panelists to interrupt and inject. They will not be rude if they do so. Uh, we all have spoken a lot, and it's a lot easier to engage in discussion, and we'll see whether that works. Uh, but with that, Lily, if you could start us off, uh, why uh, should we be pursuing a mark-to-market method of tax accounting? Uh, what's the goal here? Uh, thanks, Steve, and uh, thank you so much uh, to TPC for inviting me. So, um, so I thought I'd sort of step back for a minute and talk about what is the rationale, why are people talking about this idea in the first place. And uh, it's generally an idea that's coming up now as a strategy for taxing the wealthy. So I'm mostly going to talk about it in the form of a proposal to, you know, limited to the top 1% or the top 0.1%, but not applying uh, mark to market, or what I'll sometimes call an accrual tax to everybody. So, um, so the rationale starts with we have a lot of uh, serious problems with taxing the wealthy. Uh, and to understand why, it's important to understand that the wealthy earn their income in very different ways from most of us. So um, outside the top, most people get the vast majority of their income from wages and salaries. Um, if you look at the bottom 80% by income, uh, they, or sorry, the bottom 95% by income, they get 80% of their income from wages and salaries. But if you look at the very top, they start to get most of their income from capital gains. So if you look at the tippy top people earning over 53 million, which is one in 100,000 people, they only get 10% of their income from wages and salary and 84% from capital gains, dividends, and private business income. Um, so because they earn their income in such different ways, this means that they have access to very different tax planning strategies than most of us do. Um, and there are two big tax planning strategies that are relevant to the discussion today. Um, so the first is that the wealthy tend to characterize a lot of what is effectively their labor income as capital gains. And there's a, a great paper um, by uh, Smith, Zidar, and Zwick that estimates that about three quarters of business profits received by the wealthy are actually attributable to their labor. So there's lots of recharacterizing labor income 
um, as often pass through business income. Is that beyond carried interest? What is that, entrepreneurs building a business? What's going on here? Absolutely. So um, so carried interest is kind of the poster child of this, but it's, it's really a tiny fleck on the elephant of how people are able to recharacterize their labor income. So this would just be um, people who are majority or sole owners of a business and put in relatively little capital and work on that business and end up earning huge returns. And if you've put in lots of labor and little or no capital, that means most of your return is labor income. But if, if it's a pass-through entity, won't it generally be subject to ordinary income taxation currently? If uh, it's not, like the so, current interest, you know? Yes, uh, so... Um, funds. That's the current income, though. When you sell out, it's capital gain. Yes. Yes. All, all the goodwill you built up with your yes. with your labor becomes capital gain when you sell. True. Yeah, and that's I think how this paper starts to get to three quarters of that is uh, well that their three quarters is including the pass through business income. And by the way, I think the world's changed a lot. I think it's shifting more and more towards private equity models and the ability to use pass throughs and other business enterprises to capture. Uh, accretions of wealth. And so this could yet be a problem that's gotten worse uh, in, say, the last uh, 40, 50 years and major tax reform. But I guess to Mike's point, we're really talking about goodwill or, or yeah. kind of an intangible that goes with the business, yeah. not sort of realized profits of the business. Of the business, right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the issue um, with all of this uh, income being characterized as business income is that then a portion of it, going to Lucy's point, can then be characterized as capital gains. And um, that, uh, if you take advantage of some other loopholes, can mean you can lower your top rate on what would have been potentially labor income from 40.8% all the way down to either 23.8% or 20%. So this is obviously a huge incentive to try to figure out um, ways to recharacterize your income as labor income that is also um, eligible for capital gains rates. Um, so the other thing that the wealthy have access to that most other people don't is the ability to defer realizing income um, in the form of capital gains. So when you get paid your salary or your wages, um, you don't get to say, oh, I'd like to have that reported 10 years from now. Um, but with capital gains, you can hold on to the asset and delay realizing it. Um, and to give you a sense of the scale, nearly 40% of the wealth of the top 1% is in accrued and unrealized capital gains. So this doesn't even show up in the data that the IRS has on how much income from capital gains wealthy people have because it's not realized. Um, so they actually have a lot more income than we typically see um, in estimates, although I should say that TPC um, does take this into account in some ways. Um, and there are a couple other recent papers that estimate that the wealthiest individuals realize about half of their accrued capital income, but half they do not. Um, so at the extreme, if you defer realizing long enough, your tax rate begins to approach zero if you take into account the time value of money. And then if you hold until death, um, your ta tax rate on capital gains does actually become zero because there's this provision called stepped up basis that forgives tax, the capital gains tax on all accrued gains when you die. Um, and that's also true, um, the charitable contributions were mentioned. Um, when you donate appreciated property to charity, uh, typically the accrued capital gains tax is forgiven as well. Um, so the problem with this is these tax disparities between uh, strategies that are available to the wealthy and uh, to everybody else magnify economic disparities. Um, they also mean the tax system is really complex and there's traps for the unwary, even if you're among those wealthy people. If you don't take advantage of those strategies, you're worse off. Um, they also distort the economy. So the deferral incentives and uh, uh, stepped up basis create something called lock-in, where you have an incentive to hold on to underperforming assets just for tax reasons, because if you hold on to them, you get to defer paying the capital gain. And so this leads to capital being misallocated um, throughout the economy just because of the tax system. And so the way we've addressed lock-in effect in large measure is to lower the tax rate on capital gains uh, to induce uh, the sale of assets, mobility of assets, and uh, curtail lock-in. Yes. But you've got a 
a non-carrot approach then? You, there are alternatives to carrots. We can use yes. sticks. Okay. Yeah. So, so the dynamic that Steve's talking about um, is why the earlier panel talked about how the revenue maximizing capital gains rate right now, um, JCT and CBO and Treasury estimate is sort of in the range of maybe 28 to 30 percent. And that's very different from ordinary income because the thought is that if you raise it above that, people will start deferring their realizations so much longer that you'll start losing revenue. Um, so this is why we have, in part, why we have much lower rates on capital gains than on ordinary income. Um, so this leaves policymakers kind of with a dilemma where unless they at least partially addressed the second problem, these deferral incentives, they can't ad fully address the first problem of much lower capital gains rates than um, rates on wages and salary and other ordinary income. Um, and it also means there will be limits on how much revenue you can raise from the wealthy because once you start raising that capital gains rate too high, um, if you don't change the deferral incentives, you'll start to lose revenue. Um, so the clearest way to deal with this dilemma if you're a policymaker that wants to raise more revenue from the wealthy is through something like <coughs> accrual taxation. Um, there are other options, but um, that's you know one of the big rationales for being, this being on the table. Accrual meaning pay as you profit. As you accrue the profit, you start writing checks to the government every year. Yeah, so I've been um, using accrual tax more than mark to market. Uh, because to me, mark to market is the tax lawyer's accrual is the yeah. economist. <laughs> well, to me, mark to market is all assets every year you pay tax on the appreciation, whereas I haven't really seen a, a proposal that would apply that to all assets. For um, illiquid or non publicly traded assets, usually it, uh, an accrual tax would still wait till realization but then would tax it as if you had been taxing all along or tried to. Um, so in that sense, I feel like mark to market can kind of give a false impression that every asset in the economy is going to be taxed on its appreciation at the end of every year. Um, but, but we often use those terms interchangeably. So, um, so I want to talk briefly about uh, some of the pros of uh, or advantages of an accrual tax system. and. Uh, uh, then Lucy and Mike, I think, will talk about a lot of the challenges involved, and I have some thoughts on that, too. Uh, so one of the advantages is you can raise a lot of revenue exclusively from very wealthy people through an accrual tax. Um, so one alternative that might have come to mind is uh, to deal with this dilemma I talked about is you could repeal just stepped-up basis. And uh, then you could raise that the That is the forgiveness at death exactly. of, of your inherent gain. Um, and when you say repeal stepped up basis, would you, I think Jane referred to gains at death or something. Is that what you're talking about then? Yeah. Or just so, a carryover um, basis so your inheritor carries over the low basis. And that's, I think, been viewed as problematic because then you have, you know, generations where you might have to establish a basis when you ultimately did dispose of so we don't have the information, and we also may not collect it, the tax for many generations. So. so so, people have proposed both. I'd say the more politically prominent proposal now is realization of death. So um, President Obama proposed that um, with some substantial exemptions. Um, a number of Democratic presidential candidates have proposed it. And President Trump, as a, as a candidate, proposed something like that, although it was unclear exactly what he's proposing with the $10 million exemption. But he seemed to be going down that path also. Well, if we go back long enough, he also proposed a wealth tax. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if you did uh, repeal stepped-up basis and treat uh, death as a realization event, you could raise on the order of $300 billion over 10 years if there were the, some exemptions. That's um, the exemptions of the Obama proposal. And if you raise the capital gains rate to 28%. And the transition issue is very important. How, are you, are you, tax, are you, would you collect tax on all earlier gain or just a gain accreting after some date, which would be administratively troublesome? I, I believe the Obama proposal it, at the it would wait until someone passes, but then it would be all of the accrued gain okay. would be taxed. And, and if you repeal the estate tax and trigger gain on death, what are you going to do about gifts 
Uh, so, so this would also tax gifts as a realization event. Okay. Um, so the uh, currently gifts, you get a carryover basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually think you should repeal the estate tax, but we could get into that later. Um, so, uh, so again, you could raise a fair amount of revenue if you repealed stepped-up basis, and you could raise the capital gains rate. Uh, there, I have not seen any estimates from the official estimators about how much uh, the revenue maximizing capital gains rate would increase, uh, but there was some indication from TPC it might go up to 50%, which would be a pretty huge increase in the revenue maximizing capital gains rate. So if we had gains at death, uh, people would be uh, less willing or, or less likely to just hang on to their assets to the end, literally. Uh, they would, in fact, start selling assets uh, earlier and pot potentially, um, I guess this goes to the elasticity of responses, but you could then raise more money from them with higher capital gains rates. Exactly. Um, but the revenue maximizing capital gains rate would not be as high if you repealed SEPTA basis as it would be if you moved to an accrual tax because there's really two incentives to lock into underperforming assets. One is stepped-up basis, and the other is just the realization rule of before you die, you've got a big incentive to hold on to an asset for 30 years or longer to defer paying the tax. And only an accrual tax would deal with that. So if one thought repealing stepped-up basis, raising the capital gains rate was not raising enough revenue from the wealthy, then you really need to start looking at an accrual tax if you want to get that revenue maximizing capital gains rate higher and raise more revenue. Uh, so in terms of how much revenue you can raise, there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, as far as I know, there's been no true revenue estimate yet of an accrual tax. Um, in uh, my paper with my colleague David Kamen, we did um, what's called sort of a mechanical estimate. Um, so we estimated how much you would raise if you applied an accrual tax, so that's both mark to market for publicly traded assets and uh, tax at realization with a look back charge for non-publicly traded assets. If you applied that to the top 1%, we estimated um, you would raise on the order of 2.1 trillion over 10 years if there was a 15% avoidance rate. But I should caution that that doesn't include any other behavioral effects. Um, so that could reduce the estimate. On the other hand, that just assumes a um, top rate of about 40%, and you could make that rate a lot higher once you have an accrual tax. And it also uh, doesn't assume any transition rule like a toll charge, which could also raise a substantial amount of revenue. The top 1%, the so, so you're addressing the inequality that the congresswoman highlighted exactly. because the other 99% would not be chipping into your system. Yes, so, and I think, uh, Jane, your estimates might be for everybody. I yes. think they seem like they're a similar order of magnitude, Pretty but, <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, I should emphasize that, you know, once TPC, let alone JCT and Treasury get into <coughs> estimating this, they're going to be looking at behavioral responses. They'll be looking at interactions with other provisions. So. Um, this is sort of an attempt to give an order of magnitude rather than anything um, precise. And this is a really huge modeling challenge um, going forward. Um, so a couple other advantages I will uh, mention really quickly. Um, first, uh, uh, you could substantially increase the revenue maximizing rate for capital gains, as I mentioned, which means you could then tax capital gains at the ordinary income rates. And a lot of the tax avoidance strategies that I teach my law students are about how can you characterize income as capital gains? Um, how can you defer realizing gains? And so a lot of those tax planning opportunities, um, which are also inefficient and distortionary, um, could be really reduced. Um, it would substantially reduce the incentive to defer selling property. Um, if really well designed, it could almost eliminate this for the wealthy. Um, but a lot of the uh, devil is in the details. Um, and I should note that compared to a wealth tax and compared to step to basis, a wealth tax um, would not do this. It wouldn't affect either way deferral incentives. Um, repealing step to basis would reduce deferral incentives, but not by nearly as much as this. 
Um, and then a final couple uh, advantages before we get to the challenges are um, this could not be avoided through multinationals shifting profits to tax havens. So that's a perennial issue with taxing capital income. Um, well, aren't those companies going to invert? Aren't they going to shift their profits to tax havens and reduce their um, taxation that way? And here, because the stock price, whether it's a US or foreign company, should embed those profits in tax havens, you're effectively taxing them. Whereas a bunch of other options, um, you deal with a lot of uh, inefficiency on that margin. Um, and then the last well, thing I is, think that yeah. does kind of assume a little bit that these corporations are held by US persons, right? Yes. You could have them be held by, you know, globally, and therefore that difference would, would be less significant. Yeah, so this is a um, tax increase just on US people, um, US citizens. Um, whereas uh, if, for example, we increased the corporate tax rate in the US, a lot of that burden would fall on foreign investors in US companies. Um, the downside is that it, some of the burden would fall on people not in the top 1%. Not a huge portion, but some, whereas... Blue hold through mutual funds. Exactly. Uh, whereas uh, this proposal, at least as it's being currently advanced, that is restricted to the top 1% or less, um, would not do so. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is we do have precedents for this in the US. Um, so we have a bunch of rules that have been mentioned earlier about straddles, about PFIX. Um, we also tax most debt effectively on an accrual basis. Um, I mean, we can get into the details of how to the, what extent that's true, but there's something called the original issue discount rules that basically say if you um, issue a bond and say, well, you pay me $100 and I'm gonna give you back 95 10 years from now, we don't let you do that. We basically impute interest to you and um, that's, basically like an accrual tax. And so debt you know, instruments although are- Although as we were ta talking about earlier, yeah. that's generally speaking a known amount of income. Yes. You know, you, you buy the bond at you know 95% of its principal amount, you know you're gonna get that five over time. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's not the other challenge that we're dealing with here, which is you know assets that are gonna vary in value um, much more significantly. Yeah. And I, I, I would say, and maybe Mike has experienced this too, that People hate the OID <laughs> rules for that reason, because it's viewed as you know phantom income, and they, there's a lot of yeah. time spent making sure that they don't apply, um, you know, and, and sort of getting to the numbers that get you yeah. out of them. So, J just like they hate the PFIC rules. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess my question on on maybe both of those would be, well, of course, people who have to pay tax under the OID rules or the PFIC rules hate them. We all hate paying taxes. <laughs> right. Um, it but mean, yeah. is the tax system, would you think the tax system would be better off if we abolished the OID rules or what kind yeah. of distortions yeah, would result? Yeah, not necessarily arguing that, but just that, you know, um, it, it does influence behavior a lot, I think is the point. But um, even that, do you think it, it would distort behavior more if we got rid of them? Uh, probably not. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. It's just a lot of time is spent by, and, and, yeah. and maybe we don't care about this, but by taxpayers, by, by their you know, accountants and, and lawyers, you know, thinking about things like that. that yeah, we've had those rules for yeah. decades now, and I think they were uh, first promulgated because zero coupon bonds uh, were being um, issued to, to allow investors to defer, um, defer tax, presumably even uh, to, you know, stepped up at death if, if you know in, in some circumstances. And there are disconnects yeah, between the company that was issuing the bond who could take a current yeah, tax right. shelter. Yeah, right. There, yeah, there were a lot. There were a lot of tax shelters before the OID <laughs> rules. That's why the OID <laughs> rules were big revenue raisers, I think, at the time. So one last thing for you, Lily, uh, before we uh, go to, to to the next segment, uh, is there any serious question about the constitutionality of an accrual basis tax system? Uh, we have a whole bunch of rules in place now. <laughs> Does anybody believe those are unconstitutional? I would say there is no serious constitutional question. So um, an accrual tax is distinct from a wealth tax because the income tax is clearly constitutional. We have the 16th Amendment. Um, 
the issue with a wealth tax is we still have this provision that says if something is a direct tax, it has to be apportioned among the states. And so if a wealth tax was a direct tax, which is a very open question, then you would have to uh, make sure that it is per capita the same amount in each state. So you'd effectively have a much higher wealth tax rate in, say, West Virginia than you would in New York, um, which doesn't seem great. So that is not an issue with an income tax. There are some people that raise whether mark to market or an accrual tax um, would be unconstitutional, usually referencing this case from 1920. But uh, that case has been, uh, so in that case, they did find Eisner that v. something Bicone, if you, if you're teaching related class, well, to right. realization was unconstitutional. Right. But it's been really limited to its facts. We've for decades had um, provisions in the tax code that have been challenged in lower courts um, that are marked to market, and all of those challenges have been rejected. Um, so I don't think this is a serious okay. issue. So let's shift now to our practitioners. Um, and maybe, Lucy, you can start us off. Uh, like, what has been our experience uh, with mark to market and accrual regimes, as Lily just highlighted? We've had those in place. And what are the challenges that we might face adopting a broader uh, accrual method or mark to market method of tax accounting? Thanks, Steve. So, yeah, I'll start off just describing in a little more detail, and some of the earlier panelists have alluded to it, a couple, really kind of three mark-to-market regimes that are um, currently in, in the tax code. One is, and we'll see kind of to what degree they're instructive here, um, one is uh, the mark-to-market tax that applies to securities dealers. It also applies electively to securities traders and to commodities dealers or traders. Um, but uh, obviously people who elect into it are a little bit in a different you know, paradigm because they chose it. Elected um, by the taxpayer, not by right. the government. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's true. Um, and I think, um, I, I think it gives us really a limited amount of information because for two reasons. One, you know, securities dealers, they hold you know, huge quantities of securities and derivatives and these are subject to mark to market taxation. But they're also, marked to market for financial accounting purposes. So really the tax is following you know, the book and that um, usually is something that you know, taxpayers don't mind as much. Um, secondly, uh, securities dealers are, are often, they're not usually speculating, they're often hedging their positions and so they've, they're holding you know, securities or entering into derivative transactions um, with their customers and then they're hedging that you know, as much as they can. And so, the mark-to-market system, you know, it isn't, it isn't measuring kind of ups and downs in the way it would for, you know, somebody just investing uh, or speculating in property. Um, it really kind of more measures their economic, you know, pr that profit that they lock in by hedging themselves um, in a more, a more effective so way. So dealers have balanced positions, and as a consequence, when you're marking to market both sides of their positions, uh, you eliminate a whole bunch of tax-induced volatility. That's and by the way, in the 90s when we were drafting the mark-to-market rules for securities dealers, uh, one of the drivers uh, for the rules was actually the securities industry who liked having mark-to-market rules come closer to their economic income. And later, traders of commodities and securities, many want to elect in order to match and even match their book income and, mm -hmm. and even out their, their economic income to the tax yeah, income, that, right? That's right. It's really not something that they find objectionable for the most part, has been my experience. Um, and it also takes them out of a lot of rules that I'm sure we'll touch on um, that are you know, punitive toward um, taxpayers that are doing certain things like hedging themselves. You know, straddle rules can be uh, punitive. And if you're on a mark-to-market -market basis, you're kind of out of all those rules and you're just you know, measuring what, you know, for dealers, I think, effectively, you know, captures their true economic income. Um, n nonetheless, there has been litigation on valuations, um, so it, it hasn't been completely without friction, um, but, but it's easier to apply it to uh, securities dealers because they are valuing for book purposes. So there is something you can look to, you know, and a lot of the, the securities that they hold are, in fact, you know, traded on exchanges, so it's just, it's a, um, 
you know, a, a narrower group for, for whom it fits better than perhaps, you know, other, other taxpayers. Um, section, uh, section 1256, which is the rule that requires a mark to market um, for certain types of assets, so futures contracts, um, other types of exchange listed derivatives, and that's a rule that is um, applicable to any taxpayer other than certain you know, parties uh, doing hedges. Um, so it's broad in that sense, but it's very narrow in the sense that it only applies to this limited category of, of positions. Um, and as somebody mentioned earlier, those, those are um, derivatives for which you know, they're on, a, on an exchange, so there's valuation, um, you know, a kind of a clear valuation. Um, also, they are, you know, if you think if you enter into a futures contract, you have to post margin um, to secure your obligations. And on a daily basis, the exchange will, you know, mark your position to market, and you either have to provide more collateral, more margin, or you get some back. So the liquidity issues also are not, you know, the same as they might be for other, other um, positions. We should, we should get some new stuff. Okay. Uh, Mike is telling me we're spending too much time on this and that we should, we should talk about the new proposal, so maybe we'll pivot to that. But I, 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 think, the, I think the big picture is that, you know, they're sort of interesting and worth looking at, but they, they really, I don't think, tell us how a system like this would operate in practice when it's a much broader category of taxpayers and also a broader category of, of um, assets. So, uh, so I think we'll, we'll delve into the recent Wyden proposal um, and... I'll kind of uh, start it off, but I think Mike will, you know, okay. jump in at any point. Yeah, what happens when you go broader? Widen is broader, right? Okay. So yeah, Widen is broader and narrower. So Widen is broad in the sense that um, his proposal uh, would apply to kind of all assets, basically, although we'll talk about it. There's mark to market and then there's look back, so it applies differently to different types of assets. Um, but it is narrower in, in that it applies only to specific taxpayers, what, what it calls applicable taxpayers. And um, I know we'll, we'll, we'll talk about tradable and non-tradable assets. I know Mike will get into that. But just to pause on um, who it applies to, because I think that's an important you know, design point. Um, Wait, let me, let me just say one thing. Okay. I mean, the Wyden proposal, which is on his website, is a, uh, is a very comprehensive proposal. It's like 40 single space pages with not a lot of white space like some of these other proposals are. <laughs> And it just sort of, when you read it, you see all the issues. It, they, it raises something like between 50 and 100 different issues they want comments on. You sort of get a sense of the complexity of this. We'll be talking about two or three or four, but there's literally and dozens and dozens of issues that come up in trying to come up with a system. And, and as I think Steve said, the devil's in the details. And um, to come up with a comprehensive system is not going to be simple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the most detailed proposal I think I remember yeah. having seen. Um, and the affected taxpayers, actually, Lucy, yeah. this is beyond securities dealers and sophisticated derivatives traders, say. So this, Correct. this needs to be dummied down, even for rich guys, potentially. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and just to note how it um, carves people out, it, it's... There's basically an income and an asset test. And if you're, you know, $1 million of income, $10 million of assets, um, and it says that that would be indexed to inflation. Um, and if you, were, you meet either of those standards for three years, then you become you know, subject to this rule. You can get out of it by having three years where you don't meet either of these tests. Um, so potentially somebody can shift back and forth between, you know, if they're on the edge, being subject to the rule and not subject to the rule, which understandable why it's done that way, but that, that creates a fair amount of complexity when you think about you know, applying a look back rule to that and, and, so, and, and the draft notes this point is how, you, how you'd have to think about you know, somebody who held some sort of property, real estate or something for you know, 30 years and there were you know, X number of years in which they were subject to the rule, ex <laughs> you know, other years where they weren't and how you'd calculate it. Yeah, yeah just, just to add to that, my theme of complexity, we're talking about going from one set of rules for taxing gains on assets to three sets of rules. The current rules for whoever is exempt because they don't have much income or it's an exempt asset, that's rule one. Rule two is for the mark to market assets, the publicly traded assets. And rule three is, is all this stuff that's not exempt, but it's not publicly traded. And so you, this is the wait and see, and then you pay a tax with this interest charge. 
and to have three separate sets of rules imposed on large numbers of people out of, out of the blue is really going to be a very well, let's start undertaking. with the any simplicity benefit probably because for the people who aren't in the rule you have to keep oh yeah, probably yeah. all of the straddle and, and, rules, yeah, wash right. sale yeah. rules, other kind of Oh, yeah, yeah. Rules. yeah, you're throwing all that on top of the existing rules because you need the existing rules for the exempt assets. And then you have the tax lawyers like us who are trying to get between the rules and go from one rule to the other and back and forth. Uh, it's, it's really going to be a challenge for the government to deal with all that. It sort of reminds me of in TCJA, they sort of did the same thing both with um, you know, the, the, uh, past, the lower pasture rate for people, which is a whole new concept. And then the guilty rules and beat for CF for controlled foreign corporations. I mean, entirely new concepts that they just imposed on top of everything else without taking anything away, and just added it on. And for those regulate for those statutes, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages of regulations that have come out so far, and they're just beginning. It'll be years and years before. And an enormous amount of tax planning under those rules because of the uncertainties. Mike has written 150 yeah, well, yeah, bar not, yeah, reports. Yeah, 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 not, yeah the, <laughs> the bar reports and other comments is thousands of pages. But it'll be years and years before people know the answers to a lot of questions and a lot of the tax planning issues have been resolved. And that's just, you know, especially things like guilty and beat affect a relatively few number of people, the U.S. multinational corporations. We're talking about two whole new sets of rules and, you know, the same people were affected by publicly traded and non-publicly traded assets. We're imposing all that on top of the existing system. I just hope the system can bear it. So I might just add one softening to this. Um, so David Bradford was a, a very beloved economist, and he always distinguished between three kinds of complexity. So there was rule complexity, compliance complexity, and transactional complexity. And rule complexity was like when you have a general anti-abuse rule and nobody knows what it means. Compliance complexity is how many forms are you filling out? How many calculations are you making? Maybe like how many regulations are there? Transactional complexity, he always said, was the worst. And that was when you were distorting economic behavior for tax reasons. And so I think I would agree that this would increase compliance complexity for people in the top 1%. Um, you know, maybe particularly for the financial institutions that they use who are going to have to report to them how they should be reporting their income, there would be a lot more rules. But I think if it was well done, it could really reduce transactional complexity because right now, a lot of, you know, what I, Lucy and Mike have been very adept at doing and what I try to train my students to do uh, if they're going into private practice is to take advantage of these deferral incentives and to take advantage of the differential between the capital gains and ordinary rate. And so if you did this well, and that's an if, um, it could really reduce that kind of complexity, which is actually the worst thing for the economy. And so you'd be, in exchange, having more compliance complexity for relatively wealthy taxpayers. And then you know, query how much they individually would be experiencing this complexity. So if we had, you know, if they had all publicly traded assets, I think they'd probably get an information return at the end of the year from their financial institution saying, this is how much income you have to report, um, which wouldn't be all that different from getting a 1099 for their interest income this year. So it might be that a lot of the burden of that compliance complexity goes on to the big corporations like it does with the guilty or, or other provisions. Well, with, by transactional complexity, you mean taking actions that you wouldn't otherwise take. Well, what yeah. would you say then about you know, private companies that nobody wants to go public anymore because uh, people would rather be under the rule for non-traded assets than traded assets? Do you think yeah, that would be a big enough effect? They already don't want to. Um, so we already have big incentives to stay private um, with the pass-through rules, with a lot of other rules. But, uh, but even so, I think that also depends on how accurate the look-back charge is. And if... It is, uh, I think if you skipped the whole look back charge, if you just applied mark to market to publicly traded firms and nothing, the pure realization to privately held and illiquid assets, you'd have a big incentive. Um, but if you have a look back charge, it may be that in some circumstances you want to be public, in some circumstances you want to be private. It's true that it would or never be. Or at least it would even it out and not yeah, the, the difference. Even it out. But I think it, no? there's, there would still be a big difference. It's, it's, I think. It doesn't even it out. Yeah. Paying, my, paying cash tax now is not the same thing as paying cash tax when you sell. I agree with Mike. No matter and what when, the interest charge is. Yeah, and when you layer on, if you have 
you know, very volatile assets, and, and some of these points have been touched on, and you think about, you know, going up and then going way down, and... Are you going to get a refund? Are you going to get a refund? Oh, you've you've never Buffett converted a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, and let me tell you, writing the check hurts, but you think about all the taxes you save later. I'm not sure it's that dispositive, at least to the extent oh, that you have both regimes, as Lily suggests, you do level to some extent the playing field. I'm not saying it's ever going to be perfectly level. There's lots of discontinuity. No, the Roth IRA, that's different. There you, you're getting a clear long-term benefit. You pay some tax up front, but you're getting a long-term benefit. Right. Here, you know, there's no long-term benefit to, uh, to being under mark to market. <laughs> Well, that just depends on the high, it depends but, on the interest yeah. charge. No, but assuming you get it accurate, assuming it's an accurate rate, so as an economic matter, it's probably the same. But the idea of paying tax now and then paying tax now if the stock goes up and maybe you're maybe maybe you're maybe not getting a refund if the stock goes down, that's not the same thing as waiting until the end and paying with an interest charge. You just said if it's accurate, then there would be no. No, no, accurate no, means it's, it's no. not accurate. Even even with kind of an appropriately sized charge. Uh, yeah, I'm saying mark to market isn't accurate because it's up and down. While the, for the non-public stuff, you wait till the end and you see what your net gain is. And also smooth over time under mark to market, like we, the last panel was discussing. Assuming you're getting a refund when your stock goes down. <laughs> I think you and, sort and of you have, have to do and that, right? And you, have, and, you have, and, you have, and you have unlimited carry back periods. By the way, do we know, Mike, yet whether um, Senator Wyden would allow losses uh, to be deductible, carried back, uh, refunded? Any idea on that? Are they ordinary versus capital? He raised, as a question. He raised it as questions. But okay. for that to work, I mean, not, whether or not you allow losses against, against compensation, that's one question. But even aside from that, if... If I have, a, if my stock goes up today and I pay a big tax on this unrealized gain, and then it stays the same for 10 years, and then it goes down, are you going to give me a 10-year carry back for my Maybe. loss, or do I have to wait until I have some more gains? No, you might get a carry back. Okay, with interest? You don't know. No. Like <laughs> I draw the line somewhere. <laughs> okay, so that's why you're sort of better off under the private rule. You don't have all these problems. Oh, maybe. There, there is some but, precedent in the, in the rule that applies to futures contracts. There is a broader look back. It's like it's three, three years as opposed to, you know, not having a look back at all for individuals. So there's some precedent for that. But I agree that politically... You know, it's the Warren Buffett writing a billion dollar check. It's going to be hard to. Let's talk about traded assets for a moment. That, that should be our simplest case, right? So, a traded asset that means traded on some public exchange, oh, presumably, although that could yet be open for question. But because they're traded, we are pretty confident of their value. And because they're traded, if you're short of the money to pay the tax, you presumably could sell all or some of your asset to raise the money to pay your tax. Um, what design issues come up with, with just the, the traded assets? What, what, where, where does that start, Lucy? Like, what is traded, uh, by the way? Yeah, I, and I think that's... I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have my answer. I'll send you later. Um, <laughs> that, that's a very complicated question because, you know, there are, there's you know, the New York Stock Exchange, but then there are, you know, a lot of different... Um, you know, markets that, that aren't kind of as obvious as that. They're over-the-counter markets. You know, debt, for example, doesn't generally trade on exchanges, but there is a, you know, kind of um, significant price discovery because dealers provide quotations for, you know, many categories of pretty liquid. My baseball debt. card collection, I think Mike suggested yeah. <laughs> Beckett's runs a, a pricing list for that. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the IRS has struggled with that with debt because there are different rules for publicly traded debt, or where there's a market and where there's not a market. That's right in the code. And they had some rules that didn't really work very well, and now they put out some new rules that basically say everything is traded if you can find somebody who'll give you a quote. Even, and an, even an indicative, not an indicative a, an quote, right, right. It's really broad because they, the, the, those rules made more sense than the rules for non-traded debt. And then you get into things like I said. They suppose those dealers will put out price lists for uh, for baseball cards. Does that mean they're traded for marking your baseball card collection to market? Is eBay a is, is eBay a if you can find people <laughs> selling the same thing you have? Who knows? I mean, but there's going to be all sorts of issues about that once you get off those exchanges. And are you going to include foreign exchanges where there may be a little bit less um, sort of oversight to things? So I, it's, it's not an easy um, you know, point to get at. And I think somebody else had mentioned earlier that 
the ability to value something may not necessarily mean it's actually as liquid as that. I mean, just because somebody is offering a, a quote, it doesn't mean you can sell your entire position with that, you know, that value. Um, you also sort of think to the point of, you know, you mark something at the end of the year and you're going to have to write a check, you know, by April. You're going to see a lot of odd effects of, you know, significant sales on you know, January 2nd <laughs> in order to make sure somebody has the cash to pay that tax. Well, you'll probably wait till April before you, the day but before you, you file your return. You're risking something, though, right, if you have to do uh, that. Yeah, because yeah. if, you're, you know, if you hold <laughs> true. Um, cryptocurrency or something, it may be worth you know, a quarter of the value by the time you get to true. April. So. Yeah. And, and how, like, what are the basic questions remaining on a mark to market, or and I guess this would not be accrual, that, that's for non-traded assets. Um, is that straightforward, at least that we, uh, we, I guess we have, what kind of issues do you have if you're marking a, a traded asset? We've got liquidity, we've got not valuation. Um, what other things, Mike? Did, I guess you earlier oh, the raised- law, the, law, this is losses. the losses. I think those are the main issues for traded. The harder issues come up with non-traded assets. Okay, why don't we start there? You want to give us a couple of those issues? Uh, uh, what would be the best uh, way to tackle those? Lucy, what do you think? <laughs> um, well, let's see. Yeah, loss, I think, is, is going to be another issue for a look-back regime, right? Because if you're kind of trying to say this type of, of income should be viewed more like wage income than, and, and you know, you imagine somebody that has gain positions and loss positions that for whatever reason are not traded, um, you kind of, I think, would want to make it as parallel as possible so that they, they sort of get the inverse of whatever the surtax would be. But again, you know, you have the political aspect of it, so that may be less um, appealing. But so I, I don't know. The political really. aspect being what? Having the government write checks for losses? <laughs> and effectively okay. write well, a check, yeah. Well, you know, the, but when you say writing the checks for losses, that can mean two different things. One is like a refundable income tax where you have nothing but losses. Are you going to get a check back? I don't think people are suggesting that. Maybe they are, but that we've never had that in the history of the income tax except for low income people. As opposed to a carry back. Yeah, there's, there's carry backs. So the question how far back you go and what, can you offset current other ordinary income? But I don't think anybody would suggest if the stock market goes down when you, everybody has all these losses, the government pays out all this money to people who've never paid any tax in the first place. But you know, other things with non-traded assets, just talking about political stuff, if you, um, if, if you buy an asset in year one for, for $100, and then in year 20 or 30, you sell it for $1,000, and let's say interest rates go up a little bit, I mean, a good part of your gain is going to be, so you, the, well, your total tax is going to be uh, an awfully big percentage of your total gain when you take all the interest charge over a long period of time. And it, you may, people may say, you know, it's not going to look good, even though it all makes sense economically because it's no different than if you paid tax under mark to market. But when you tell, try explaining to somebody who's maybe built a business and is now retiring and is selling out, selling off their business for thinking they're making a lot of money, that it's all going to taxes because it's collected all this interest charge over 20 or 30 years of their career. It's not going to go over very well. They could always fix that. Maybe they remember they, they started the company in year 12, not year one. They get a better result, right? How, how, how do we keep track of that, actually? Well, you have to have, know the holding period. Now you only have to know if the holding period is more than a year. Under this system, you've got to know the holding period forever. Well, and with um, pass-throughs, it, it could potentially could be more complicated too, right? Like yeah. if you put in more money into you know, a partnership um, that's your business or your, your interest in it you know, increases or decreases over time, you have to think about those design points. Yeah. And the other thing, if you, make a, you know, if you make a gift, there's going to be this, for the mark-to-market stuff, that's easy. But for the non-traded stuff, if you make a gift, there's going to be an accumulation of, of, of tax you owe. If you, when you die, all the non-traded stuff is going to be, de you have to have it be a deemed sale at that point. So there's going to be this gigantic, not just valuation, but it's like an estate tax where all the, you have to figure out how long you held all your assets and, and this, compute the interest charge, and there's going to be a big tax at that point. And speaking of gifts, uh, er, the earlier panel, somebody asked uh, or observed about charitable contributions. Which way does this cut having a new regime uh, for assets that are held um, 
long periods of times without sales that can encourage or discourage uh, charitable contributions and maybe even gifts to your, your children or relatives. Yeah, no, we were talking about that before. For, for gifts to your kids, I think it, well, for traded stuff, for gifts to your kids, it doesn't matter. For non-traded stuff, you would have marked it, it already. yeah, you've marked it already. But for non-traded stuff, to give something to your kids, you're going to pay that tax. <laughs> you may not want to do that anymore. I mean, gifts to charities, I think, are different because I think it'll both discourage and encourage gifts to charities for people in different situations. And if you're if you're on the fence about making a gift of some appreciated asset to charity, there's less reason to do it because the tax benefits are less because now you don't pay tax on the appreciation and you still get the full tax deduction. Under this new system, whether it's traded or non-traded, either you've already paid the tax on the appreciation or you will at the time you make the gift. And so the after-tax benefit is a lot less because you get the benefit of the deduction, but you don't get the benefit of the exempt income. I mean, unless you designed a rule where, like today's rule, if you donated something to charity and it was a non-traded asset, if you, you know, got you need to a special rule, yeah. paying that, yeah. you know, sort of yeah. yeah, but but the, the the other factor is that if you know you want to get, if you have some asset, you know you want to give it to charity, you're better off giving it sooner rather than later because you avoid all the future either mark to market tax or deferred tax. That the, the you know, that it's no tax in the hands of the charity. So you'd rather give it now rather than later, which also means, I think, that there'll be a lot more focus on donor-advised funds because you still keep control over the asset in practice. And so you give it now. You need to decide later what charity you want to give it to. But in the meantime, you've avoided all the mark-to-market or deferred tax that you'd have to pay as the asset went up in value. So in that sense, there may be an incentive to accelerate uh, donations. It may not help the charities if it goes to donor advised funds, but you know, it may be a reason to accelerate donation. But, but in the end, once you have the appreciated asset and you're not sure you want to give it, then it may discourage you. It would be interesting to know, I'm sure somebody has studied it, whether um, gifts of property to charities, you know, the, the percentage of them are traded, you know, tradable assets versus other kinds of assets. I assume it's probably large, large percentage traded assets. Because um, those are, you know, the ones that get the benefit of a higher deduction. Well, returning back to uh, our evolving economy, we've seen over the last several decades um, the advance of intangible assets. Uh, intellectual property turns out to be really important in the global economy. Um, how about accrual or mark-to-market of intangible assets? Do those pose special problems? Because those are now a very big part of our economy. Yeah, yeah we talked about that too. You know, if, if, I, if I'm an inventor and I, just, and I patent something, and then I sell the patent, in, or, or a light, yeah, I sell the patent in 20 years, I assume I'm going to be subject to all these rules and pay this, this, big, um, this big interest charge, or if I just run my own little business. I start a hardware store and I sell out. I assume when I sell that, I'll be subject to this big interest charge also, just as if I had marked to market. So it's, it's a lot of things people may not be thinking of as being potentially subject to mark to market. At least, I mean, the Wyden proposal seems to cover everything. It's pretty the, much every asset other than some personal residence up to... Yeah, farms. Yeah, it's, perso farms it's personal... It's personal... assets. It, it's sort of... Yeah, it's sort of funny. It's personal... Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it, retirement... Qualified retirement assets... Not non-qualified retirement assets, those seem to be covered, including executive, deferred executive comp seems to be covered. Family farms are exempt, but no other small businesses. I, I, you know, there's no logic to that. And, and then personal residences, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Although with re retirement funds, they're exempt from taxation in any event, so to mark them or to require accrual is, is really not that relevant, is it? What's the significance? Well, no, it would be your interest in the fund. <coughs> okay. Just like you have, if you have an interest in a business or an interest in a, um, in a, you know, in a sole proprietorship, they could, in theory, tax the value of your interest in the trust, but they, they, I think correctly they don't. Mm -hmm. up, I, up to some point. I up to some point. Retirement assets are just totally excluded mm -hmm. from his proposal. Yeah. Right. For yeah. farms yeah. and primary residences, there it, there's a two million, two million and five million exclusion from counting it towards whether you're in the regime in the first place, but then once you're above that, if you have more than three million in retirement assets, the portion above it would, uh, sorry, sorry, not retirement assets, yeah. the portion above 
the $5 million farm would then be subject to the regime, right. but not the first $5 million. And then there's the exclusion of a million of income or $10 million in assets. So it's really affecting a pretty well, tiny only, share think, of, of taxpayers. I think, yeah, that's only for putting you in the regime, right? Yeah, once you're in it, then you don't get a $10 million threshold. I think you, you know, in other words, if you have $10 million of assets I think for three that's years and you're in it. ambiguous. So he talks oh. about whether there should be a uh, transition or phase in. Oh, and yeah, personally, I would really advocate a phase in. Um, it's really bad to have cliff effects. So, um, so just to clarify for folks, he says, in general, putting aside all these special things for farms and retirement assets, if you have more than a million dollars in realized income for all income other than unrealized gains or 10 million in assets, um, then at some point you start becoming subject to the regime. And you could say, at that point, all of your assets are subject to the regime. Or you could say, at that point, some portion of your assets, maybe the portion above that 10 million, is subject to the regime. Um, and he asked questions about yeah, whether they should be that point. phase in. Yep. Yeah, you know, one other thing with this, with the non-traded assets where you don't pay tax until you dispose of them, one benefit people will think they have with that is, well, OK, I don't pay tax every year. Maybe we'll just forget to pay the tax when it comes time, and I'll put it into a corporation, and it'll be there forever. And you know, it apparently transfers, at least under the widening proposal, transfers into corporations are tax-free because you get the stock back. And but but you know, people may just forget. I mean, that's it's just like people forget to do all sorts of things now. They've been prefix, they forget to pay the interest charge. I mean, you know, that's what people do. And the question is, how does the IRS really enforce that? You know, they have all these non-traded assets and. You know, they make people sell gift, make gifts and things, and they put them into corporations, and they stay there forever. And what's going to happen? And you know, the, the other side, we're, I see we're almost at it, but just one other issue we should just mention is using corporations as a tax shelter. If if you just don't want to pay tax on something, because you put it into a corporation, that's tax free. Then the corporation sells the asset. You pay corporate level, or, or the corporation holds the asset or sells it. You pay corporate level tax. But nothing has happened at, your, at the individual level. And so you can, you, you're going to be able to avoid tax that way. You're putting stuff into corporations or partnerships. I mean, the Wyden proposal has a very elaborate set of rules to deal with that. But they ask questions about, is that going to work? And what else might they have to do? All right, well, let's finish up. Uh, last remarks from any of our panelists. Any last word, Mike? It'll be, a, it'll be complex and, and not necessarily, I'm not against it necessarily, but it's going to be complex and a boon for tax lawyers like us for, <laughs> for many years to come. I'll just say I agree with Mike. <laughs> well, Lily? Um, so I guess two things. I, I think it's important to sort of keep a dual focus on how much it would be a boon to tax lawyers and how that would compare to how it would improve the efficiency of the economy and the fairness of allocating tax burdens between the wealthy and less wealthy people. And at some point, if it you know, does enough on improving economic efficiency and um, taxing the wealthy at rates that, that at least some people think are, are more fair, that could be worth you know, uh, Lucy and Mike and, and others getting more fees to deal with the transition to the new regime. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, just to applaud Senator Wyden and Rep Representative Schakowsky that I think a lot of the issues this panel are, is raising are really important, and they're really important for drafting. And um, probably my biggest concern about this proposal is that there is adequate time to draft it. So having worked for several years on the Hill, I had no idea pr prior to getting there how long it took to draft an effective bill on a technical issue. And um, so I'm really glad that this is something that they're digging into. I, I know Representative Schakowsky mentioned they're working on legislative language. And um, a lot of the things that uh, are being raised here are things that are going to have to be worked out in drafting, a lot also in regulations. But the more time there is, the more time there are for panels like this, the more time there is to respond to questions like Senator Wyden has raised. Um, the better chance there is of drafting a bill that actually yeah, well, is effective. I think that's a, a good observation to end. I worked for the Joint Committee on Taxation in the early 90s. We devoted three years to drafting the mark-to-market -market rules for securities dealers. Uh, those rules were part of two vetoed tax bills uh, for different reasons until the mark-to-market -market for securities dealers was enacted in 1993. 
But the advantage of veto tax bills was the House would pass a version of 475, and then industry representatives would come in and tell us where we had gone wrong, and we'd heard, hear from uh, uh, lawyers in practice. The Senate passed a version. The conference committee passed a version. We had nine iterations, which is really unusual for legislation, of, you know, of actually passed legislation uh, with input. It was incredibly complicated. And so at some level, uh, we're highlighting a lot of the kinks in the current proposals and pending drafts. Uh, and that's because the kinks exist now. The question is, could the kinks eventually be ironed out in a way to accomplish everything that the members and uh, we tax policy people might like to see? Yes, let me just answer that, 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 that we didn't have that three-year period with TCJA, which led, is what led to a lot of the problems. And so you just get this law that nobody really, nobody outside of few people in the government had ever seen before. And not unexpectedly, it just had gaps and things that didn't work. And it really forced the Treasury Department to put out you know, all these regulations, some of them pro-taxpayer compared to the statutes and some of them anti-taxpayer compared to the statute, because the statutes either just didn't work and it gave really unfair results to taxpayers or giant loopholes that taxpayers could take advantage of. And so there's a lot of question whether a lot of those regulations are valid because they're just not the same as the statute, but going in both directions. And you know, that's not a good way to run a tax system. And so it's much better to people have time to look at it in advance and, and figure out you know, in both directions whether the statute makes sense. Well, I would add to that, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the TCGA. But uh, there are a lot of provisions there that built on uh, legislative language that was put out um, starting in 2011. So, uh, so even in that case, um, when it was taking that long to draft and going through different iterations, um, there were a lot of problems. And I think the provisions that had not seen the light of day before the TCJ was voted on or had only been out for a couple months were the most problematic ones. Um, but I think that does just highlight it is really good to have a long timeline that you're working on these proposals. All right, we have a, a few minutes for questions. Uh, yes, it's, it's very far, far back. Uh, Mindy Hersfeld, uh, question for Lucy and for Mike. Uh, so I hear all your concerns and I agree with all of them, but my question for you is given the uh, concerns that Lily is responding to or raising, do you uh, think a better, is, is there a better option or would you dismiss uh, Lily's concerns that she's responding to? Go ahead. Uh, I, I think they're all very legitimate concerns, and I don't know if there's a better option. <laughs> it may be a wealth tax, but I think there's constitutional problems with that. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. I, 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 they're legitimate concerns. I don't know if this is the right answer. Um, it's at least, a, you know, a, a proposal worth thinking about, but, but um, I don't know, you know that I have a view that it is the right way to go. Yes. Hi, Alan Davis. Um, two questions that are, I think, related, maybe not. Um, the first is, I'm having a hard time hearing any argument for why a wealth tax, if you, if you put aside the Supreme Court, which I would like to do for many reasons, um, <laughs> if you put aside the Supreme Court issue, is there is there any real case to be made why the wealth tax would not be a better way to address uh, the wealth problem? And the related question is, and I'm curious if you have an opinion about this, um, if you take a typical billionaire, say he was running for president, say has $50 billion, and um, you assume that he's going to earn $10 billion over the course, uh, sorry, $5 billion, over the course of the year. So at the beginning of the year, he has $50 billion. Before taxes, at the end of the year, he has $55 billion. In your opinion, at the end of the year after taxes, should that person have $52 billion, $50 billion, or $45 billion? <laughs> I'll, I'll maybe start with the first question. I think I lost the chain on the second one. Um, so I think there are, are real arguments each way for a wealth tax versus an accrual tax. 
Um, if you set aside the constitutional argument, and I, I think the constitutional argument, I still think the better argument is that a wealth tax is constitutional. There's just more risk there. So I think if someone were to, or Congress were to enact a wealth tax, they'd be well advised to have a backstop in that that was maybe something like an accrual tax in case the court um, ruled it unconstitutional. Um, but uh, a couple arguments maybe in favor of an accrual tax relative to a wealth tax would be that uh, a wealth tax would not tax rents as directly as an accrual tax would. So typically economists talk about normal returns to assets and um, rents or super normal, normal returns. And some think it is more efficient to tax rents than to tax normal returns. Um, I have my questions about that, but that is one argument that's put forth. Um, another issue with a wealth tax is uh, generally one would think you'd then have to value all wealth each year, including privately held or non-publicly traded assets, whereas under the accrual tax we're discussing, anything that wasn't publicly traded, you would wait until there was an actual valuation point. Um, you could imagine a wealth tax that had a look back charge or something, and so it could do the same thing. I haven't heard of a proposal like that, but that is another. You missed Bill Gale's earlier, yeah. earlier assertion there. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Bill Gale made that suggestion in the last panel. The problem with that is sort of the same problem I raised when you finally sell a private asset you've held your whole life. Most of your gain is going to be eaten up, and you'll be surprised. I mean, if, if, you, um, if you have a, a deferred wealth tax, and then and then you, uh, you, I don't know when you attack, you die. This deferred wealth tax, may, maybe it seems like you know, it's sold as, oh, it's just two cents, or maybe now it's five cents on, on the dollar. But that adds up over time. And <laughs> by the time you die, you may find you don't have much left if, if, if it's a deferred wealth tax on your non-traded assets. I mean, it's not that, it may not, in the end, be different in, economically than if you paid the tax every year. But it's certainly going to seem a lot different mm -hmm. when you die. It's going to seem like an estate tax at a very high rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Jean. Uh, I'm sorry, Gene Strelly, Tax Policy Center. Uh, and that has to do with the double taxation of income and whether one thinks about integration when one does it. So uh, effectively, if you're paying a corporate tax, unless you have some sort of integration, so you pay the corporate tax and then you pay the tax on the accrued gains, the accrued gains might be due to nothing more than retained earnings. In fact, many years ago, long before we had the current wealth bubble, uh, I did some estimate crudely that I concluded almost all the gains in the economy were either inflation or retained earnings for the most part. That dodges interest and everything's done with that. So maybe you could do some integration for an individual up front, but now how about the person who gets the, uh, is in the corporation and has some uh, great invention, so the corporation shoots up in value. So he's now selling the future earnings that are going to be subject to tax. I don't know that one could think of an integration system to avoid the double tax there. Or do we not worry about the double tax if we're going to be taxing retained earnings of the corporation uh, now or in the future, and then we're going to tax on an accrual basis as well? Double, double tax of corporate earnings or yes. double tax of investment return, once on the income tax, one on, once on the wealth tax. That's correct. Or, or the, crude, the first, not crude, the second. Crude. Okay. So... Um, I think in Eric and Alan Viard's paper, they did propose uh, integration as part of moving to mark to market. And if you were to apply a cruel tax to everybody, I think that would make a lot of sense because you'd be taxing potentially all corporate income on a mark to market basis at ordinary rates. And a lot of the rationale for the corporate income tax is sort of as a withholding mechanism because we don't do that. Um, Given that the proposals on the table seem to restrict the accrual tax to very wealthy people, I'd be more nervous about that. And I think it, um, it creates a dilemma of, you know, do you do what is, you know, maybe better tax policy with respect to those very wealthy people and them owning corporations or respect to everybody else owning corporations? My guess is you probably, as a practical matter, wouldn't do corporate integration uh, in that situation, but that would be a question as part of you know, a major design question. Yeah, the, I mean, the other problem with integration, obviously, is what do you do with the foreigners and the tax exempt shareholders? You, yeah. you can't give up all that income, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, Erica? Um, Wait, no, I got it. Erica <laughs> and then an Eric. 
Thank you. Question for Lily. Um, I'm curious. Uh, we've been talking about a look back tax or you know accrual as sort of a backstop because of all the valuation problems for mark to market. But what what if you flip the paradigm? If we just said the tax on the wealthy is going to be the look back tax, which avoids a lot of the boundary issues of what's publicly mm-hmm. traded, what's not, w- would that? Would that achieve the objectives you described um, if you just had the look-back tax? Uh, I mean, I think that's certainly uh, an option worth considering. Um, I guess a couple mm, challenges to it or ways people might uh, respond not to do it are first that one issue is you may still have lock-in to the extent people think the regime's going to be repealed. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so if you do mark-to-market for publicly traded assets, at at least you're sort of um, eliminating it with respect to publicly traded assets. And this might be what Mike is going to. If people really think that's a big risk, then um, having sort of the dual approach for publicly traded and non-publicly traded could create an incentive to invest in non-publicly traded if you think in five or 10 years, the whole thing's going to be repealed. Um, And, oh, what was my second thought? I'm forgetting my second thought, but I'll come back to it. It'll certainly delay the receipt of the cash by the government. (laughs) Yep. Also, it puts a lot of pressure then on the rate or the amount being right. um, Because it's kind of a blunt instrument, right? I mean, you know, you're going to apply some sort of interest rate, maybe blended interest rate reflecting interest Mm -hmm. rates over time. But your appreciation, you know, may have been early on or later. It's a little, Mm -hmm. little bit rough. Yeah. I mean, the other thing we sort of mentioned in a footnote as our paper is... Doing that would be a little bit akin to having capital gains rates rise with the holding period, um, which would be less distortionary economically because it would be accounting for the time value of money. Um, so, so that could be you know another variation on all of this that would move in the direction of accrual taxation without going fully there. You know, one other thing I forgot to mention before is you know one other effect of mark to market uh, for public stock is that it means the government has a, a really big interest in the stock market going up because they get a lot of money and they don't have an interest in the stock market going down. I mean, what is that going to do to their to pushing the Fed to lower interest rates to have the stock market go up? I mean, I mean or, or announcing that. Do, we, do we, we want a government that has an incentive to, to, to well, affect the stock Well, we finally have market? a Chinese trade, trade agreement at hand. I think that's boosted the stock market at least eight times in the last four months. <laughs> Eric. Okay, so this is a question from somebody, an old guy who's been around for a while. I think for years, people have talked about the exemption, the step-up in basis as the worst feature of the, the, the tax code and tried to get carryover basis, and it was repealed after three years before it even took effect. And so I think people think, wow, if you could get gains at death in the code, that would be like an extraordinary reform considering – the history of, of, of where we've been. So I guess my question is, w- with low interest rates, how much worse is it to have gains at death? Uh, and, and am I just assuming that's so much simpler? Is it really so much simpler than the other option? And how do you guys weigh the, the gains at death versus uh, a, a mark to market? Death and, and gifts. And gifts, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I am... Um, very pro uh, taxing uh, gains at death and gains at gifts as realizations events with some, you know, modest exemptions. So, um, so I think that would be a great step, and I think it would also be a great step to then raise capital gains rates. And I'm really curious whether there will be more information on um, how much how that changes the revenue maximizing capital gains rates and how much you can raise. Um, but there are limits to how much you can raise from that. And so I think a lot of the question is, you know, given our fiscal challenges, given some of the investments in low and middle income families that are being discussed, um, how, what is the revenue target? And at some point that may not be enough. And then to me, an accrual tax and a lot of other options that we aren't discussing today are really worth considering. But, um, but, yeah, I think that's a, a great first step and would certainly not say anything negative about it. Yeah. Would you change the estate tax then? If you did that? Yeah. No, I wouldn't. Um, 
So I view the rationale of the estate tax as maybe threefold. So only the first part, I think, is as a backstop for the income tax because we don't tax gains at death. And so, um, and if you look at very large estates, a huge portion of the value of the estate is unrealized capital gains, way over 40%. So, um, so I think that's one rationale. But another rationale is we don't tax the receipt of large inheritances as income. So if you, know, you inherit $10 million, you don't pay any income tax personally, whereas if you work for $10 million and you actually you know, report it as salary income, you're gonna be paying a lot of tax. And, um, and then I think the last one gets into political power and you know, concentrated aristocracies over time. But, uh, but I think repealing stepped up basis only gets at the first and um, we still need a wealth transfer tax to deal with the fact that we don't tax inherited income as income and that there may be you know, unique problems for society of having generation after generation inherit economic power and political power that doesn't come from their own efforts. So we would have both an estate tax and a real death tax. <laughs> Fair enough. A market tax. <laughs> well, I was just gonna follow up on Eric's point here because listening to everything and the difficulty of having either back to where they were roughly of 5.5 million per person, then you would be able to increase the capital gains rate without having much of a realization problem to say, I'm just say 29.6%, which is the rate, the pass-through rate. So if you did those two things, plus uh, other things like, you know, uh, the performance fees of hedge funds, I mean, wouldn't that, I mean, it wouldn't raise quite as much revenue, but it would raise considerable revenue if you combine step up in basis with uh, a lower exemption. And then you increase the capital gains rate and you went after these other things. Isn't that a much more realistic uh, tax reform proposal that would move you a lot toward the right answer? I mean, just think in the last tax bill, we couldn't even get the hedge funds taxed at ordinary rates. So here we're talking about these huge things. So that that's my three-part proposal. Yeah, and this just, actually sounds like mainly an assignment for Eric to figure out how much <laughs> revenue we get. At yeah, the question is how much revenue I think you'd get if you brought the exemptions <laughs> back down and you brought the rate, the capital gains rate, 29.6, and I'm sure you could think of a whole slew of cats and dogs that are worthwhile doing. You'd raise some real revenue and you could actually get it through Congress and you wouldn't have to, you know, give all these tax lawyers, you know, like the gift that keeps giving for the next 20 years. Well, so oh. you, you do carryover basis on death but not trigger the gain on death? Is that the idea? Oh, uh, no. At death, you would pay the, you, you would have no carryover basis. A death tax. Yeah. Oh, so you, oh, so you trigger the gain. Yeah, correct. In other words, we're going to have one valuation okay. at death. That's it. And no, 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 an estate tax based on value of your assets or triggering gain or both? both. It's, you have an estate tax based on value with a lower exemption, and you trigger uh, the gain on death. So okay. both. For somebody who has mainly assets that are at a huge gain, then it's just, yeah, in effect, like a high, higher estate tax, right? We're not going to get interest. Okay. All right, I'll, that's certainly a viable thought. One last question, all, all the way in the back there. <laughs> um, Rory McFarker, just to return to the fantasy world for a second. Um, if the concern on the non-traded asset side is that you're going to be faced with an enormous bill at the moment of realization with the look back with the interest, why wouldn't you ask people to pay an estimated tax each year based on that. And if they don't have liquidity, then they should borrow because they'd be paying with the interest at the end anyway. So to take That's away the sting idea. of the, the final realization. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think that's another option really worth considering. Um, a lot of this comes down to politics. So um, with the exemptions that are being discussed, um, this regime would potentially apply only to very wealthy people who generally have a lot more ability to borrow than most of us. Um, but uh, liquidity is always you know, a great talking point. <laughs> and so um, I think you could imagine uh, paying estimated taxes. You could imagine them saying, well, if you don't have enough liquid assets, you can defer with interest. Um, you could imagine saying people can opt in to mark to market uh, if they want to with respect to their non-publicly traded assets. And I think a lot of those are things that as the lawmakers start drafting this are, are worth considering and worth putting out in the public to get the reaction um, in terms of how viable it is. That would, that, would, that would also raise questions. If you pay your estimated tax, then you claim the asset went down in value. Are you going to allow a refund of the estimated right. tax? Yeah, well, if you it seems paid like it. you're creating the liquidity <laughs> and the valuation issues that are kind of the reason that you, you know, wouldn't apply a mark-to-market regime to trade in non trade Yeah, actually, you might as well just. I think that's a great idea. That. I have not read it before, but that's, there are enough people who think about this problem sitting in this audience that maybe they'll think about that further. Uh, I think are we out of time now? Okay, so that's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We, we solved for, all the problems. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.